this week on the Back Table Podcast. Your goal for quality improvement needs to be SMART, and that stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. So you want SMART goals, and then you want to plan, do, study, act, or define, measure, analyze, improve, and sustain. I can't emphasize enough. What often happens is you go through a cycle, you define a problem, you plan some improvement, you do something different, and then people go back to the way they used to do things. That sustain phase is important to keep your new way of doing it as the way that work gets done to the way they used to do things. This is Jose Ocha Silva, your host this week. We are happy to have as guest this week, Dr. Peter Steinberg. Dr. Steinberg did his urology residency at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center then did a fellowship in laparoscopy, robotics, and endurology from Montefiore Medical Center. After this, Dr. Steinberg went back to Boston. He has served in multiple administrative and leadership positions since his dressing residency. His resume is very extensive. And recently, he earned a certificate in safety, quality, and informatics from Harvard, so congratulations. Currently, he's assistant professor at Harvard University School of Medicine. He's a urologist at Beth Israel Deaconess and an Associate Director of Quality and Safety in the Department of Surgery. Dr. Steinberg, Peter, it's a pleasure to have you here as a guest today. Welcome to Backtable. Great. Thanks so much. Glad to be at the table. So how did you get involved in, in, in this topic? It's interesting. It's one of those things that just kind of happened to me, I feel like. I think this happens to a lot of people as you grow both clinically or administratively. I had a lot of interest, frankly, in adverse patient outcomes and malpractice, especially early in my career, you know, in large part because as a young surgeon, you generate a lot of complications. So you want to try to learn how to prevent them. I was also named in a malpractice suit as a resident. And frankly, that was a very formative experience in a lot of ways. And it got me starting to think about safety, uh, especially in the OR as it relates to complications. So it just sort of happened organically. You know, I would get involved in being a content expert in reviewing events at our institution or being involved in cause analysis related to an adverse event. It started to pique my interest. And as time went on, I realized that was a good lane for me, you know, more so than being a researcher or being a program director. That wasn't going to be for me. In terms of quality improvement, you know, I was always someone who came up with ideas and tinkered with better ways of doing things. I'm not particularly creative. However, I'm good at seeing how other people do something that I'm doing to make it more efficient or better. And so that was how I got more involved in sort of the quality of things. You know, I, I never came up with any ideas of my own, but I could see where other people were struggling or try to identify what the, uh, the barriers to things were. And I started actually doing some of this stuff in my job, but really had no formal training. And that's how I ended up ultimately doing that certificate program recently. And you mentioned, I mean, the other positions, research, program director. So, so you knew that you were going to stay into in academics. Yeah, I, I always had an inclination that I wanted an academic job, in large part because I like a lot of the things that are happening at academic centers. You know, I got nothing against being in a private group. However, I felt like it was a better environment for me to be in given sort of the, the, the nature of how people inquire about different things. I feel like very no fault kind of environment in a lot of ways. So I was never a particularly talented researcher, although I did try to do some, and I occasionally do try to write some papers, but I think that's something that requires sort of dedicated interest and effort. And, you know, frankly, the residents don't really like working with me on projects. I have colleagues who they like to work with more who are more prolific. So I don't want to say it's a dead end, but that was never really where things seemed to be going. So at any rate, that's basically uh, what the path was. I, I decided to stay in academics, and this seemed like you know a good area for me to pursue. I've been out about 12 years now from finishing uh, or being in practice, actually. And so you know, once I'd been practicing for six, seven, eight years, I needed to find some other way to kind of keep embellishing my career. Not that I was bored with clinical medicine. So at the moment, you're not doing anything clinical? Oh, no, I do. Actually, I'm 80% clinical. Ah, okay, okay. okay. But I, I, I do this 20%. But as I you know, got to that, I'm not quite mid-career, but close, you know, something to expand what you're doing to give you a new set of challenges. And again, it's not that operating isn't challenging, it is. 
but doing something new kind of kept me fresh. And so doing some dedicated training and more involvement in this area has kind of rejuvenated me in three, four, five years. No, I, I completely understand what you're saying. I mean, that's one of the reasons I, I do the podcast. Uh, and it's just to have something different. Uh, my co-host, uh, Dr. Aditya Bagrodia, he, he has talked about all these ventures, I guess, or, or, or I forgot what the name he, he calls it, but it's just like, like doing something different uh, than just a clinical to balance your life. Absolutely. And, and I think it's important. So, so Pete, so, so let, let's start with some definitions. Okay, so uh, quality, safety, w what are we talking about when we hear that? Sure. So quality, there are a lot of different ways to define it, but really what you're talking about is getting good value either for a low cost. That's generally how most people, and when you're talking about healthcare, cost is not the only parameter, but that's what you're talking about. You're talking about getting good outcomes, safe outcomes, effective outcomes, things the patient wants in a relatively decent amount of time that are efficient and are fair. And that's generally how of medicine tends to define it. Safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and other people will just say you're getting outcomes for low dollars. That's a more economic way of looking at it. But that's what we don't want to get effective, unsafe, expensive care. That's not quality. Okay, so so that's quality. And, and what about safety? So safety has, you know, two components. You're dealing with adverse events. So that's harm that just happens during patient care. That's not preventable. But then there are errors where you're not meeting the standard of care. So if you have an error, but nobody's harmed, that's what you call a near miss. But when you overlap errors with adverse events, you get when those Venn diagrams overlap, you get what we call preventable harm. So safety deals with trying to meet the standard to prevent adverse events. So trying to make things safer so that you deal with preventable harm. If you're dealing with stuff that's not preventable, there's nothing you can do about it. But likewise, you want to reduce the number of errors you have so you don't have near misses. But it's that overlap where you're dealing with people who are harmed when you don't meet the standard. And that's where safety comes in. So in one part, you have the economics of being more efficient. And then the other one is how to, using that economic, maybe be safe at the same time. So that, that's why we usually hear them together. Is that the idea or are they actually different things? They are different, but they overlap in some ways. And you can certainly have combinations, but in some ways they're different. But there is a Venn diagram that overlaps both fields. But the tools and approaches and what you're trying to deal with in both areas in some ways are distinct. You certainly could have a quality improvement project where your goal is to improve the safety of something. But you can also just improve the quality of doing things in a more efficient way with less waste or less downtime or defects or whatever that's got nothing to do with patient safety. So there is overlap, but they're also in some ways distinct. And the toolkit for dealing with both is also distinct in some ways. And in terms of quality, I mean, the economics, I mean, in the urology world, are we talking about equipment? Are we talking about the type of procedure you're doing in a patient? I mean, what are we talking about in terms of that? Sure. So, so really the way to think about getting good value and getting quality in healthcare is you want patients to get value added activities. You know, you want to do things for them that they're willing to pay for basically. And sometimes you need to do things to enable that. So for instance, let's say someone's coming to see you to treat a kidney stone. Well, the patient needs to be registered. They need to be roomed. All those things enable it, but they really want to see you to get the stone treated, right? Everything else that doesn't help that process along, that is waste. And so when you're looking at quality, you want to get rid of all of the waste in the system. And there's a lot in healthcare. So you're talking about patients waiting, you not utilizing all your talent, patients needing to move around too much, you needing to move around, you know, going to too many offices, extra steps in a process. All of those things are examples of waste in low quality. So within urology, that could be things like getting bone scans for low-risk prostate cancer. You know, that's a low quality activity. It could be not utilizing 24-hour urine testing on recurrent stone formers. 
It could be sending all your vasa from vasectomies to the lab for pathologic analysis when it doesn't really change anything. And it's just adding cost to the system. And you can think of an infinite number of these things, but it could be as simple as, I'll give you an example. You know, I do a lot of vasectomies. We have a young son, he's eight months old. I wanted to start getting home so I could pick him up from daycare. So I didn't want my Friday vasectomies to end past 4.30, which is when they're supposed to be done. I realized the patients were getting there very close to their procedure time. So we just started Doximity texting them and say, hey, come in half an hour early. And they started coming in 10 minutes earlier and I started finishing on time. You know, it's a small example and it was an easy one. No, no, but, but, but I completely understand. I mean, and when you mentioned waste, my, my first instinct is just to see all the, and I don't want to talk about this, but just mention it, all the, the, the management positions that, I mean, what, what do they offer to the system? Sure. And that might be a completely different topic because, I mean, <laughs> but really, you as a urologist, I mean, what do you bring to the table? Or Because or, most of the time, you're the only one, or I, I'm sure that most of the time you're the actual surgeon and, and the one talking about the procedures, and then you have a lot of nurses, a lot of supporting. And how do you try to convince them, educate them to see may, maybe this is necessary, maybe it's, it's not a waste? How do you juggle with that? So I think there are a few ways to look at this. and. These particular disciplines, and I'll, I'll sort of break them out, they're very heavily dominated by, at least at our institution, by internal medicine. You know, no offense to them, but internal medicine and hospital medicine are very heavily involved. And there's a lot of nursing involved in this, which is completely appropriate because, you know, they have expertise in these areas. Surgeons tend to be underrepresented in these areas, in my anecdotal experience. So in some ways, you're providing direct content expertise. In other ways, you just have a different mindset than internists and nurses when it comes to approaching clinical problems. And so bringing that mindset into any discussion, it's just a different viewpoint on the same clinical issues. But frankly, I think surgeons tend to think in a very efficient and high quality manner in a lot of ways, because we try to do things that are somewhat streamlined and try to sort of get to the end result of patient care. So that's a lot of what you bring. I mean, some of it is just direct knowledge of what you're dealing with in terms of devices, diagnosis, testing, whatever. So it can be a, just the, the mindset, but it can also be direct content knowledge. And how does a problem come to the surface? I mean, who brings it up? When do you decide it's a problem? How does that come into play? So that can come at any level of the organization. So... Usually the people closest to the work know where the issues are. They know where inefficiencies are as far as quality goes. They know where unsafe conditions and near misses happen as far as safety. And they know when adverse events happen as far as patient care. You know, the CEO of the hospital doesn't know about that stuff unless it's very high level. Retained foreign object, unexpected infant death wrong side surgery. They don't know about low-level harm. And likewise, when it comes to quality improvement projects, they may have very high-level goals for the organization, but they don't know that I want to get home at 4.30 and if my vasectomies check in half an hour before their appointment, I'll accomplish that. So you've got everywhere along the continuum, people closest to the issues will be able to identify what the problem is. If the solutions are simple, you don't need to go any higher than, frankly, yourself or maybe your manager to fix them. And that's really a lot of what we encourage is dealing with things that are within your control. We've had certain events where the issue is related to our medical record in between institutions. Well, okay, the fix of that is to implement, say, Epic. Well, we can't do that. The CEO of the health system can. So you need to sort of scale what the fix is for your level of problem. So people in the trenches, what we call the sharp end, are often able to identify where the problems are. You run into challenges if you need help of people above your manager or yourself to fix them. Likewise, the hospital may have very high-level goals that come down to you, and you need to figure out how their goals fit into your daily life. So it can be bi-directional. But frankly, most of this stuff is really a very low level, very close to the patient. Because, I mean, for example, I had this issue, or, or it was like three years ago, they brought a concern regarding uteroscopes. 
we were doing re, uh, the, the disposable. And we got the company at that time was Boston Scientific to bring in a, a good quote. But then somebody had the idea, okay, how can we minimize the cost? So they switched to reusables. I told them, hey, they break, all that. So after a year and a half, they come to me again. Hey, these retroscopes are, are very expensive. They're, I mean, I, I told you a year and a half ago, this was going to happen. So sometimes that person in that moment wants to create a change because that, that person that made the decision, now he's in, she's in a very top management position. So sometimes, unfortunately, the quality on the long run, because, I mean, you're a urologist, you stay there in the same position. I'm in the same position, so we're there for the long run. And you see sometimes some personnel are, are always constantly changing. How do you deal with that? And Because it affects quality. Sure. So, I mean, I think there's a couple ways to look at quality improvement. And again, you're talking about trying to eliminate waste, unnecessary stuff. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Lean or Kaizen, which is the sort of Toyota way of trying to improve continuous quality improvement. There's an acronym that applies to waste within healthcare that's good to know. It's called downtime. So that's defects, overproduction, waiting, non-utilized talent, transportation, inventory, motion, and extra processing. So any process you have, you can break it down by steps and you can look and say, okay, do we have any of these? So with your ureteroscope issue, the specific issue you may be looking at is, let's just look at the ureteroscope cost per case. And let's say when you were using LithoView, your cost for ureteroscopes per case was $1,000. And let's say your cost with reusables per case was $2,000. You're accomplishing the same thing. But you could go to the hospital and say, look, here's what you're spending. Here's the case number. You know, what do you think? I mean, that, that's an easy way to speak the language of somebody there. Now, there may be other reasons why they're doing that, but that's a very good way of looking at a problem like that. You can just say the direct cost and the outcome, and you can look at them. But there really are a couple ways to focus on this. I think as much as humanly possible, if you find what's impacting your job and your patients and you try to run tests of change at the local level, going no higher, in my opinion, than your division or department chief, if needed at all. To be honest, the best is if you can do it on your own without involving anybody else other than maybe your medical assistants or your nurse or your administrative assistant. I mean, there, that's something that's relevant to you and nobody can tinker with it. If you get into more complex stuff where you need a budget or resources or personnel, or the hospital wants to do something, then it gets more complicated. But I think if you can speak the administrative language of, look, you are adding this step, this provides no value. This costs X amount. You're making this person walk from here to there for no reason. You are requiring us to keep this inventory on the shelf. You're making the folks in central processing wash this device for no reason. We have to wait for X number of scopes to get cleaned X number of minutes, and it costs this amount of money. I think those are all things that tend to be compelling to administrators. But the more you can do things as close to the problem as humanly possible, the more control you will have, and the less you're going to get into other people's needs or agendas. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but I think the closer you can get to the problem, the better off you'll be. And Pete, uh, in terms of, of us as urologists, where do you think we need improvement, at least in your institution? Where have you seen that there's a, a lot of mistakes that we have been doing that needs improvement? Well, I, I think at a very high level, I think about things within urology where there's underutilization. So I mainly do endourology and I do a lot of vasectomy care and a little general urology. So at a high level, things that are underutilized, 24-hour urine testing is underutilized. Screening people for hyperparathyroidism with recurrent stones, I think that's underutilized. I think in general, vasectomy is underutilized as a form of birth control. I think that referring people for dipstick positive hematuria to a urologist is a waste of our time. I think referring people without repeating a PSA 
is a waste of time and resources. That's at a high level. Those are things that you need the AUA, the World Health Organization, the Institute for Medicine. I mean, you know, like the Choosing Wisely campaign. Like that's, you need that level, right? You need the chief medical officer of your health system to deal with that stuff. If you want to tackle that, fine. But that's, that's like a big ask, right? You know, if you want to be on the AUA guidelines panel, fine. But that's a dozen people for a problem. So that's super high level, right? On the micro level, what I think about is I think about processes and what can you get rid of? I'll give you a perfect example from our practice. Every year we have to recertify fluoroscopy training. Our state, Massachusetts, requires two hours of annual training. We used to have to sit and watch this video from the radiation guy. Everybody would do it, but it was, it was annoying. So what we did is we moved it into our Wednesday morning conference schedule. So we made it interactive. He came to give us the same lecture, but it was interactive. People got a ton out of it, asked him a bunch of questions. It satisfies the state requirement. It satisfies the hospital requirement. We didn't have to take two hours out of our time some other time. We built it into the schedule and got that time back. It saved everyone two hours per year. So there's a perfect example of wasted time that we clawed back into our schedule for ourselves. So I think if you look at your, whatever you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and say, where are the pain points here? Why am I waiting? Why is there this extra step in this process? I'll give you another example. Every time we order a stone analysis in our system, you click stone analysis, you write in clinical history, kidney stone, and you write in what the specimen is. It's a kidney stone. So we said to pathology, can you just eliminate that? It's a kidney stone. So they got rid of it. It's two less things to write, but you know, you do that a hundred times a year. That's, I don't know, 20 minutes or something. So if you look at any process where there's annoyance, I'll give you a one, one last example. We used to not have good communication when the OR was ready for the patient to come back. We realized the problem was when the room was ready, anesthesia was ready, and the patient was ready, there was no common signal to everyone that we could go. So they changed the computer system that each team, when you check off things are ready, when all three of them are green, the whole OR team gets paged. So you didn't have to walk around and look for anybody. And it saved like 15 minutes of turnover time. So, I mean, you think about anything you do, if you look at it, if it's a pain point, break it down into its component steps and figure out where you're losing time. Where are redundancies? Where is there waste? Where is there extra processing? Look at any form you have to fill out that's redundant. Can you make it one form for credentialing? Can you make it one thing for all the hospitals you go to? I mean, we could talk about this for the next six hours. I could give you an infinite number of quality. I, I didn't know this was quality. All, all my issues in the hospital are quality. It's all quality. It's all related to inefficiencies and waste. And the question is, where's the waste? And can you eliminate it? And how far up do you have to go in your organization to get it dealt with? Yeah, I mean, you need to go to the government and, and stop that yearly certification. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can do that. That's a high level thing though, right? You know, I mean, you can take it as high as you want in the system. So, you know, my advice is find out what you have control over with needing to go the least levels above yourself. And that's where I would put a lot of focus. If you want to work on bigger things, knock yourself out. People have to do that. It's just more challenging at that level. And how, so, I mean, because from what you told me, I mean, definitely that I can make up a, a, a huge list. So how do you figure out what to tackle first? Are you doing multiple projects at, at once? Are you going one by one? How, how does that work? Yeah, so there are a couple different ways to do that. So there is something called a impact effort matrix, and you can do it on a continuum or have four boxes. So if you think about projects that are high or low impact, and if you think about the effort to complete them as high or low, I think the more you can find high impact projects that are low effort, that's where you want to focus your time. I think if you're going to deal with high impact projects that are high effort, that may be worthwhile. You do not want to do anything that is low impact, high effort ever. If it's low impact and low effort, it depends. But I think that's one way to categorize what you're working on. And you can just, you know, break them down. You can say, look, we have these six projects. Which one's the easiest to accomplish? Which one's the highest impact? If they're the same, that's where you put your effort. 
if you have multiple projects, the same categorization would apply. You can have multiple things going on at one time. Obviously, what your boss wants you to work on is relevant. So that needs to be a factor. I think you need to think about what are priorities for your institution. So that comes into play. I think you need to think about things that the patients are talking about. You know, I mean, if all the patients are complaining, your phone system sucks, you need to tackle it. So there are a lot of different ways to do it. I mean, personally, I have a whole bunch of projects going on. I've got some that are sort of aspirational that we may or may not ever get to, and you keep a list of those. And then you've got, I'd say we probably have six to 10 things that are on the active list at any one time of different degrees of complexity. I have other people I work with on this. It's not just me, but those are the big things. It's sort of, where's the impact? Where's the effort? What does your boss want? What do the patients want? What is the organization asking for? Those are the things we, we look at. And, you know, I mean, sometimes it's a regulatory body is causing you to do something. You're using too much fluoroscopy. You're breaking too many ureteroscopes. So those could all be things. But I think the impact effort matrix is an important thing to understand and a good way to prioritize if you have, say, half a dozen projects. And in terms of your team, who's your team? Do you have other nurses? Do you have residents? Who, who, who helps you with these projects? So uh, within our division of urology, so I'm in charge of, of quality and safety, we have a nurse who's sort of a project manager. She deals with a lot of different things within the office, but helps me work on all these projects. And especially if there's a nursing component, she's a great liaison. We also have our residents are required to do one project to graduate. They often come up with other things along the way, and they do this intuitively. They're like, hey, this is a problem. We're sick of changing SP tubes. Can you help us? They don't know it's a quality improvement project, but it is. So they just say like, here's a pain point in my daily life. Can you help me fix it? Without even realizing all the mumbo jumbo. So the residents help us out. And sometimes our administrative lead or other administrators will help us, you know, usually in an ad hoc manner. And then at the hospital level, there's a much bigger team. We have multiple dedicated nurses, other physicians, social work, patient relations. I mean, our, our quality improvement team is huge. So there are a whole bunch of us and there's the vice chair of the Department of Surgery is also involved with that. So, I mean, that's dozens and dozens of people, risk management, the malpractice insurers, legal. I mean, it's a lot of people at that level. So that's a much bigger, a much bigger team. And, you know, we pull in ad hoc teams for stuff all the time. And right now you're the guy within your audience. Let's say, uh, I have a problem. I will go to you. Hey, the turnover is getting ridiculous, getting out of hand. I go to you and then you start, I mean, you have your list. You got it. We've had four catheter associated UTIs this quarter in this unit. Can you look at these? Yeah. So, I mean, Pete, anything else that you want to add to quality and, and then talk about safety a little bit? No, I, I think those are the biggies. The only other thing that would add two things that people just need to be familiar with when you talk about quality. So every time you have a project, you need to be very clear about what you're trying to accomplish. And I'm going to throw a couple more mnemonics because physicians love these at you. So your goal for quality improvement needs to be SMART. And that stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. So I'll go back to my vasectomy project. My specific goal was to finish my Friday vasectomies by 4.30 p.m. The last one's supposed to start at 3.30. I want to be out the door at 4.30. It's measurable. I can tell when I was leaving. I can tell when I started. It's achievable. This doesn't require the CEO of the hospital. It requires us to get patients there earlier or me to do vasectomies faster. It's relevant. My wife and my kid want me home. And then it's timely. This is a problem now. So that was a smart goal. The way you actually do a quality improvement project, we talked about sort of what they are and what you're looking for. But... The cycle of improvement is known either as the PDSA cycle. People have made a part of this plan, do, study, act, or there's another one, DEMAIS, define, measure, analyze, improve, sustain. And basically what you're talking about is you want to define what your issue is up front. You want to measure what you're looking at. So the vasectomy end time. So my problem is I'm getting home late. I want to measure when I'm finishing. 
I want to measure when the patients are arriving. Patients were arriving 10 minutes before their procedure. All right, if we get them there earlier, I'm going to get home sooner. My improvement plan was to try to tell them to come in half an hour early. I did that. They started coming in on average 20 minutes before the procedure, and now it's just my new workflow, and I sustain it. So you want smart goals, and then you want to plan, do, study, act, or define, measure, analyze, improve, and sustain. I can't emphasize enough. What often happens is you go through a cycle, you define a problem, you plan some improvement, you do something different, and then people go back to the way they used to do things. That sustain phase is important to keep your new way of doing it as the way that work gets done. A lot of times people just, they go back to the way they used to do things. This requires management and leadership. Once you've come up with some improvement in your quality, to stay on top of it because people always regress back to the way they used to do things. It's hard to do. So you come up with your few projects, you do a great project, you have improvement, you have to continue it in the future. So that's often the hardest part. And this is where management and leadership really come in. Good. So Pete, there's this urologist here in Florida. He only does vasectomy and he has the eight minute vasectomy. Oh my God. Have you seen the video? So yeah, so I actually saw, saw him I, in person, I mean, and yeah, he, he doesn't take it to account when he starts putting the anesthesia, but definitely he does it in the eight minutes. It has to be a, a, a good scrotum and everything, but yeah, single incision in the middle, go to both sides, mucosa interposition and eight minutes. I got to watch this. That's amazing. I mean, I think you have to count the time you're numbing them up, but whatever. So he has the video. I mean, yeah, it it's, takes, I mean, he can do it in eight minutes. I got to check that out when we're done. That sounds awesome. So I'll email you the name. I forgot, but I'll look it up and I'll email you. Yeah, I always willing to learn something new. So I changed the way I did vasectomy like a year and a half ago after I saw him at a conference. He did a conference. I saw the, the technique. I changed the way I did them, yeah. I used to do two incisions, cut them, burn each end. I didn't send the the, 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 the vasforizer, but I, I cut it. I took a segment. Now I'm not doing it and the results are good and, and faster. Cool. So Pete, so, so we talk about quality already. Definitely. I mean, I, I'm impressed that most of the issues that I have, I mean, it's quality that, and, and they didn't know where to catalog it, but inefficiency, all those things, time wasted, it's just quality. How about safety? Safety in urology. What can you say about that? Sure. So the WHO defines, you know, safety as preventing errors and adverse effects to patients during healthcare. So within urology, there's a lot of different areas to think about. So big areas in general are things like medication-related errors. I mean, that's a huge one within all of medical care. So wrong drug, wrong dose, look-alike, sound-alike, allergies, drug interactions. I mean, that's huge. And you could do a PhD dissertation on that. I mean, it's a massive area. Other critical things that we know about are things like the universal protocol. So make sure you have the right patient for the right procedure, correct laterality, correct organ. You have a correct equipment available and appropriate equipment. You have appropriate support staff for what you're doing. You have a blood bank if you need it or an ICU or interventional radiology, or if you don't, you're doing appropriate things to mitigate that. So, I mean, those are just some basics. You know, certainly when it comes to surgery, there's a lot of stuff related to safety between patient selection, use of certain techniques or equipment, maneuvers that can be dangerous versus ones that are safer. So, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways you can go with it. But I think big ones are medication, correct patient, correct laterality, correct organ, correct side, correct laterality. Those are, those are really key ones and shouldn't be overlooked. I mean, I know everybody with the timeout thing, you know, but it's important. Fire safety is another big one too in the OR that's important to think about. And, and, and let me ask you this, how about Cydex? I mean, what do you think about Cydex? I mean, it's a good example, right? In my first job, they used to do Cydex for the scopes. And then when the whole white paper came out about anaphylaxis, we stopped and went to central processing. And I've always worked in a practice that's associated with a hospital that has central processing. In a, one of our outpatient offices, we have AMBU scopes now, and it's a non-issue. And to be honest, I kind of like the AMBU scope or a single-use scope. I use that, I, I'll use the congenics. But yeah, I mean, Cydex is, is pretty quick. 
So it wasn't an aphylactic issue because at our office, I mean, I'm employed. They say that it's a UTI issue, an infectious issue. I mean, single-use scopes basically are going to make most of the infectious issues a, non, a non-event, a non right? But I mean, there's, there's a good example of harm reduction potentially. Is central processing going to make your cystoscopy safer? Is using single-use scopes going to make it safer? I mean, there's a great example. If you have a patient who dies of septic shock after an office cystoscopy and your scope wasn't adequately cleaned, I think we could probably all agree that was preventable harm. I mean, it's, that's just one small example, but, but that's a great example. And definitely, usually in the OR, I mean, you, you, you're exposed to, to bigger concerns of, of safety. I mean, or, or I, mean, or, I mean, the wrong side surgery. But in terms of the office, I mean, I mean you, you mentioned uh, medication. How can we make it safe for patients? As a urologist, where can we be better? So I think some basic things are important. So correct identification of patients is important. I know it sounds cheesy. However, I think all of us have had a scenario where somebody got roomed, you didn't have the right identifiers, you weren't exactly sure what was going on, probably nothing happened, but that's a near miss. So I think you need to be really attentive to things like two identifiers with the patient. Are you Mr. Johnson? All right, fine. But the person rooming them, name and date of birth, very simple. If they don't jive, you have to figure out who it is. This has happened to me before where I actually had a patient say he was someone else who was in the waiting room. And the medical assistant and I were incredibly confused what was going on because the patients were there. They, they were both on the schedule. But Bob Jones said he was John Smith. I have no idea why he said that, but you need to verify that. If you're doing office procedures, you know, do a timeout. What's your name? What's your date of birth? What are we doing today? And look, you're doing a cystoscopy. Most guys say you're going to torture me. You're going to shove. They don't say cystoscopy, but you know that it all makes sense, right? So I think that that's important. With medications, some basic things are important. If you're drawing up the local anesthesia for a vasectomy, look at the vial, confirm that you're drawing up lidocaine. If someone's going to prepare it for you, they should put a sticker on there and label it. So with medication on the field, which is most of what we use, uh, you know, prescribing it is different. But during a procedure, if you're about to give lidocaine, if you're about to give bupivacaine before a prostate biopsy, look at the label. And if you're immediately going to use it, you don't need to label it. But if you're, if you're drawing it up and using it right away, if you're going to give a ceftriaxone IM shot before prostate biopsy, you draw it up, you give it, that's not a problem. But if someone's preparing this for you and laying it out on a tray, you need to have it labeled with a sticker because you have no clue what it is. That's very critical. I think those couple of basic things are important. Patient identification with two identifiers, timeout, and medication labeling. And you mentioned that you have a full day of vasectomy. Mm -hmm. Are you doing any sedation for those vasectomies? I give people oral Valium, personally. I also use oral Valium. So then sometimes most people would do good, but some of these guys are very, very drowsy. I mean, you cannot do a a full timeout, a a regular timeout in this case. So so what do you do in these cases? Do you make sure, I mean, you talk to the wife or to somebody that drove him? Well, I, I think, you know, there are a couple things that are important about that. So, you know, whenever I do a vasectomy. So pre-op is part of my counseling. I mean, I just saw a guy today and this came up. He asked, do I need a ride? And I said, yes. And it doesn't matter if I do or don't give him Valium. I say, you need a ride home. Now you can use your judgment as to whether they need to come with someone or whether they could take an Uber or a taxi, which frankly, I think most of them probably can. But I think, you know, that's part of the pre-op thing is, you know, do you have a ride home? We always make sure at the end of the procedure that they get to whoever's taking them home in the waiting room, or if we are going to send them home some other means, my medical assistant walks them down to the lobby and puts them in the Uber. Or if that's where whoever's picking you up is going to meet you, you know, we don't just let them wander out of the building. So, you know, if someone's not consentable, then obviously that's a little bit of a different situation. Although I will say if, if someone saw you ahead of time for a vasectomy consult, you discuss the whole thing, they come in the day of the procedure for the vasectomy and they're a little loopy from the Valium, I mean, I th- you know, I think it's reasonable that they're all there to have the procedure. You know, I think that, that that's, I mean, obviously if somebody's unconscious, that's a different issue, but you do have to use your judgment as to how impaired they are. But 
it's a strong argument for seeing someone ahead of time for the consult, not doing it all at the same setting. That's for sure. Because the other day I had a, a situation, a patient that I saw, he wanted to be in the OR, also a circumcision. Then he called, now nah, I'm going to just do the vasectomy. So then we switched to the office. So the patient was very, very drowsy. And my last note said circumcision and vasectomy. So the patient is drowsy. He's there in the table. I really cannot ask him, I mean, what happened? The nurse had a rota. The patient wanted to be in the OR. And I went outside and talked to the wife and that I felt better doing that. But yeah, it, it, it happened. And at some at first, hey, yeah, I mean, what's going on with this patient? I mean, because I mean, it's not like you can wake him up. You need to work, wait for, for the volume to pass. I mean, that was, it all worked out okay. But I mean, that, that's a near miss, right? I mean, that's an unsafe condition. No harm came from it. The guy, you originally were going to do a circ and a vasectomy, he changed his mind, just wants the vas. But that's where documentation of the change in procedure is important in the chart. The universal protocol, you know, why are you here today? What are you having done? Does that match the booked procedure in the office? You know, you may not have the same system as you do in the OR for booking a procedure. But I mean, I've had this happen on the schedule where, so for instance, we basically just have vasectomy as the template for all minor office procedures. So if it's, excising a penile lesion, frenulectomy, whatever, you need to specify you're doing something else because our booking system just doesn't allow these other things. So I once had a guy who just wanted a little thing lopped off his scrotum where it was booked as vasectomy. I didn't carefully check the chart ahead of time. And he, his wife almost passed out because they were like incredibly against any form of birth control. It was like a religious thing. And I'm like, what the, you know, but the thing that saved me was the universal protocol and the, we weren't quite at the time out, but why are you here today? So these are near misses, right? And in some ways you can say, well, the system worked, but what's the procedure confirming it? Boom. But yeah, I mean, that was a near miss. You, you had an unsafe condition. So what you need to do now is you need to say, okay, how is it we can keep this from happening in the future? Is there something we can do in the booking? Is there something we can do with the documentation in the chart? Where can we tighten up that latent hole in the Swiss cheese that might trip you up next time? So, yeah. So now every patient that if, if I already saw them and they changed in my or anything, we'll do a virtual because that's the only way of me documenting it, do a good documentation or anything. I doesn't have to be an actual virtual, but just a telephone call from my part, document it. And, and, and that way I feel safe. And, and if the patient has any other questions, we can go from there. So that's, that's what I've been doing after that incident. It's a perfect fix. I mean, look, all of us have had bad experiences and tightened things up afterwards. The question is, can you identify the latent traps in the system before they cause a problem? That's what a lot of safety focuses on is where are the unsafe conditions? We give our residents awards for filing incident reports and we want them to find, we do, you know, I give them like candy bars and stuff. I try to reward them for coming up with the best near miss of the week or the month, because that's what you want to find. You want to find stuff before it causes harm. Good. And Pete, in, in terms of the clinic or, or a private urologist, maybe that doesn't have the resources, the staffing that, 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 that you guys have and, and, and may as, as employed by the hospital also have, what do you recommend? I mean, a day of the week to do a, a reassessment of everything. Go th I mean, what kind of, of tricks can they implement to be always on the safer side? So, I mean, some basic things are helpful. I mean, I think regardless of what size practice you're in, some type of M&M is important, especially higher grade complications. So I think, I mean, if you're by yourself, that'd be kind of an awkward M&M, but I think some categorization of your complications, especially Clavian 3, 4, 5 and readmissions, higher grade complications, I think everybody needs to have some tracking of that type of stuff to see, you know, do you have some issue with your technique? Do you need more training? Do you need help? So I think that's one thing. And I really do think the universal protocol and timeouts and these basic medication things, anybody can do that. I mean, you don't need a lot of help to do a timeout for office procedures. It should be standard, regardless of the size of practice you're in. And, you know, there are forms online you can get for doing it. You could come up with your own. You could just document it in your note even. 
But I think confirming all of that is critical. Hey, Joe Blow's here for a vasectomy. You know, what's your date of birth? What are you here for? But I mean, that's it. It's very straightforward. Those, those are basic things. Getting into more complex stuff in terms of identifying upstream issues and whatnot, even that is not that complex to identify what the issues are. The issue becomes the smaller the group you're in or the fewer people you're seeing, the fewer opportunities you have to find the problems. It takes a lot of people doing a lot of stuff to unearth the issues. And you mentioned, I mean, about 20% of your time with the hospital, you're dedicated to the quality and, and, and safety. Was that like two hours a, a week or how, how does it work? I mean, are you doing multiple meetings during the week? Yeah. So basically at our place, Wednesday tends to be kind of a slower clinical day across surgery. So it's when most people have, you know, didactics in the morning, our residents have their resident clinic. So I do a lot of the stuff then. Some of the set OR meetings are that day for that particular reason. So I do a lot of it then. There's some other standing meetings that I have. So that's how I do a lot of it. And then, you know, things pop up here and there. But that's most of it, to be honest, is usually that day a week and some of those other sporadic meetings. And, and that takes care of a lot of it. I mean, you know, occasionally I, I woke up in the middle of the night the other day. I couldn't get back to bed and I came down and I dealt with some no-show related quality improvement thing. You know, I sat on Excel for two hours in the morning. I mean, that happens occasionally. But most of the time, it's Wednesday is sort of the academic day for dealing with a lot of this stuff. So funny that you mentioned a no-show. So I will probably leave that for another podcast. Oh, yeah. But it, it is something that, that I definitely, it's a challenge. I mean, how, how do you decrease no-shows in the, in the office? 20-year-old guy with, with pain, most likely he's not going to come back. But things like that, and it would be good to do a podcast about that. Uh, it's a great quality improvement project right there. So, Pete, a anything else you, you, you would like to add to the audience? Yeah, so just on the, the safety front, a lot of what has evolved in this space, I think a lot of people like to focus heavily on people's actions. You know, the person closest to the event, what did this person do or not do? And sometimes that's relevant. I mean, there are people who, and I mean, sometimes it's even criminal, right? I mean, you could have a nurse who's injecting people with potassium, right? Well, that's a very extreme thing. A lot of what relates to safety is, is below the surface. A lot of it is hidden and it's systemic, a lot of it. Not 100% of it, but a lot of it is what I like to think of as a trap waiting for the next person to come by. And so while you're doing your job, I think you can start to be aware of situations that could be an issue. And it can be the physical environment. The lighting isn't good. This light needs to be replaced. This shelf is no good. Where this is positioned is, you know, the hallway has too much stuff. I mean, it can be basic stuff like that. You know, we should have the code car in this location, not that location. You know, the floor needs to be dry. I mean, you name it, right? So a lot of it is latent. And some of it is people's actions, but that gets way too much attention. Really what's going on is stuff is below the surface. And what you want to cultivate amongst everyone you work with is a culture of bringing stuff up before there are issues with it. And it shouldn't be judgmental. Anytime somebody comes to me with something, you know, your response should be, thank you for bringing this to my attention. Thanks for the feedback about that. You may or may not be able to do anything about it. It may or may not be an issue, but that's the mindset you want to have when trying to make your workplace safer. You know, thanks for bringing that to my attention. If you have an incident reporting system in your hospital, it's important to utilize it. It may or may not get anywhere, but if you don't get the stuff into whatever system you have, people may not know about it. You'd be like, hey, this is the 15th one of these we've had this month. You may not know about it, but somebody in your institution will. So I think that's important. You know, I mean, yes, we like to focus on what people did or didn't do, but a lot of this is upstream and a lot of it is frankly hidden from view. And like you mentioned, I mean, also it's, it's on us as surgeons. For example, uh, I was hearing a, a podcast uh, the other day. Uh, they mentioned, um, for ex if you have a, a very complex case that day, you're, 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 you're tired, you're fatigued, and you have another big case, maybe it's not the best time to do it. Move it to another day. And things like that, so that you keep your inner peace that day or, or things are going bad in the OR, take a step back. And those are things that you can do on your, on your own to try to prevent some errors just by your mood. 
and you, you know, you want to do that seven times around your mouth before it comes out your lips kind of thing or deep breathing or go for a walk or, you know, all those techniques that you use at home, you can use at work. I mean, trust me, I've learned some of this the hard way. You can do all of that stuff. You know, you close your eyes and count to 10. I mean, people might look at you funny in the OR, but it certainly could be better than yelling at somebody. Exactly. And definitely, and, and causing our error on the patient. So Pete, thank you for, for being back table. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and, and everything. And we'll be happy to see you again and, and talk about the no-show project. I'd love to talk to you about no-shows. It's, uh, I love talking about and thinking about improving that one. So we'll put that on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Sabadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from... Ishan Sangwan and Vidavi Padwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.